Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Wren. I am the Member Services Librarian at the Capital District Library Council. I'd like to welcome you to our second virtual member library tour and the third tour in our series. Today, we will be touring the Schenectady County Historical Society Library. Marietta Carr, the librarian from there, will be giving us our tour. During and after the tour, please submit any questions you may have through the Q&A option on Zoom. You also have access to the chat, but we prefer that all questions go through Q&A to make sure we do not miss any. After Marietta finishes the tour, she will answer any questions you may have. All right, I'm all set if you'd like to get started, Marietta. Thank you, Amy. I'm, I'm really excited to um, be with you and to share some of the information about SCHS uh, today. Um, what we did uh, a few last week, um, my colleagues and I went through the museum and, and library and did a brief video recording um, sort of a couple of key locations um, in, the, in the library and museum that I would have shown you if you had been here in person. Um, this, this, this tour is a little bit different than what I had planned for the in-person version. Um, so it's a little bit shorter than what, what I had planned. And unfortunately, the, the, the documents that I had hoped to show you in person um, don't read very well on camera. You know, um, so we're not going to really get to, to go into that very much today. Um, but I'm going to sort of show you the video. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a chance to sort of talk about it and talk, talk through some of the um, things that are going on here at SCHS um, as we, you know, af after the video is played. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to watch the video. Um, let me do that now. So this obviously is um, an aerial view of Schenectady, um, and this is the outside of SCHS. This is our location at 32 Washington Avenue. Um, this building is called the Dora Jackson House. Um, and we've been in this location for about uh, 50 years. This is the outside of the library. This is an addition that was added on to the main house um, in 1992. Um, and this is obviously the entrance leading into our lobby. Hi, my name is Maria Nakar, and I'm the librarian and archivist here at the Schenectady County Historical Society. Today we're doing a tour of 32 Washington Avenue in the Stockade District of Schenectady. Uh, this is one of three properties that the Schenectady County Historical Society owns and operates. The other two are the Maybe Farm over in Rotterdam Junction, which is the oldest farm in the Mohawk Valley, and the Brower House Creative over on Church Street in the Stockade District, which is the oldest house in the city. We're here in the map gallery of the 32 Washington Avenue, and I wanted to point out this is uh, this gallery in particular because it is a semi-permanent display of a number of maps from our collection, some of which have been professionally conserved, uh, like this one behind me, um, and some of them have been uh, framed or ha left hanging on their original um, frames and rods. Uh, but it's a neat space because there's a lot of activities that you can do with maps hanging up in this kind of uh, configuration um, in terms of school programs or uh, visitor scavenger hunts or uh, a variety of uh, speakers using this space uh, to sort of set the backdrop of talking about Schenectady with all of these gorgeous maps uh, up for the visitors to peruse while they're learning. This map is my favorite map in our collection. It's the 1931 pictorial map of Schenectady and Union College uh, by J.D. Barstow. Uh, J.D. was a local um, cartoonist. He actually worked for uh, GE as an industrial cartoonist and he's the first industrial cartoonist Sorry. to join the National Cartoonist Society of America. 
Um, one of the reasons I love this map is just the bright colors and how, how many details can be uh, found in such a small amount of space, um, as well as some of the uh, key humor of the, the time and the area. So uh, there's a lot of like little jokes that you can find in all the little corners and uh, little nooks and crannies of this map. So it's one of my favorites. So in this close-up here of the 1931 Barstow map, you see uh, the campus of GE, the General Electric Company, and in particular, there's this figure of a magician holding a wand, and it's the magician of GE and the House of Magic. Um, and that is, of course, a reference to Charles Steinmetz and the wizardry of his inventions and the GE inventions. So this is the Yates Dollhouse, which is, as far as we know, the oldest dollhouse in the state of New York. It was built by a local cabinet, cabinet maker and a local painter. It was commissioned by Governor Joseph Yates for his grandchildren. Um, and it was passed down through his descendants, through the, the grandchildren's family, uh, for 125 years before it was donated to the Historical Society. And a lot of the interior pieces were original and are in very good shape for having been passed down through the family uh, for so many generations. It was donated to the Historical Society in 1960, and then in 1981 uh, it was uh, inventoried and uh, preserved, and then we've added this very lovely protective case to ensure its continued survival. We're here in our exhibit area. This is a space that we use for changing exhibits. It exchanges um, at least yearly. Um, the current exhibit is called Handcrafted, the Folk and Their Art. And it's a particularly great exhibit because it showcases really the beauty of everyday objects, but it also showcases a, a collaborative um, approach to exhibits uh, here at the Historical Society. A lot of these materials are on loan from people in the community um, and it was co-curated by our curator Susie Fout here at the Historical Society and Marilyn Sassy, a professor at SUNY Schenectady. With the uh, COVID-19 situation, we obviously haven't had as much visitation as we would have expected for a, an exhibit like this, so our Curator Susie Fout put uh, this exhibit and several other exhibits on our website and created a virtual experience for our community. So this is the Grimes Doolittle Library. Uh, this is kind of the main reading room. We're here in the Grimm's Doolittle Library reading room. This space is where our researchers come to answer their questions and use our collection. It's uh, probably my favorite space in the, in the Historical Society, A, because I'm the librarian, but also because it's so much fun to be part of the process of discovery. Um, and in particular, our researchers are very collaborative and it's kind of a party atmosphere in here a lot of times because people are, are really getting into their research and, and getting into talking about it with other researchers uh, and, and me and our volunteers. And it's a, a lot of joy that comes from being in this space. Uh, this space is divided up into a couple of different sections. There's the stacks, um, these are books that have predominantly been um, donated to us by private collectors, especially local historians. Um, and then on the opposite side is our photograph and clippings files um, cabinets. These also include our family files, which are some of our most heavily used materials. The family files include uh, clippings and genealogical research and uh, a lot of really interesting facts about the people who have lived in Schenectady over the years. So obviously with COVID-19 we've had to adjust our operations here in the library quite a bit. Um, one of the main things that we've done is set up quarantine areas for our 
uh, parts of our collections that have been in use. Um, the FAR table on the end there, we've set up for researcher materials, things that people have uh, used while they were here and then set them aside to be uh, quarantined um, before reshelved. And then this space in the middle here is our researcher table. Um, and it's, we've measured everything out and set it up so that no one is close to each other uh, while they're doing research. And then this final area over here is our new collections uh, quarantine area. So these are materials that are coming into the library to being donated and before they are processed, we quarantine them. Uh, this particular collection is from the Mohawk Club, which was a uh, members, private members club uh, that lasted for over 100 years in the Schenectady city. So this area of the stacks is our most commonly used area. It's called the Schenectady Row. And in particular, the city directories are some of our most heavily used books. The church records uh, that we have as well are pretty commonly used, especially for genealogy questions. I'm holding one of our yearbooks. Um, this is representative of one of our most recent successful collection development campaigns. We put out a call for high school and um, school yearbooks, and we received quite a response from the community. So our collection has grown quite a bit in the last few years, and we are adding more. Um, but it's really heartening to see the community respond when we ask for the specific types of materials that we're looking for that will help our researchers with their their questions. This is my desk. Obviously, it's a, a bit overwhelmed with things right now. I'm sure we all can uh, relate to to a messy desk, and I, I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. Always a work in progress, right? Uh, so the types of questions that we get here at the Grums Doodle Library, obviously. Uh, the primary purpose, or I shouldn't say obviously because maybe it's not obvious, uh, but the primary purpose, the, the original function of the library was for genealogy research, and that is still our bread and butter. Uh, a lot of people are trying to trace their history back to the colonial era, and our collection is pretty comprehensive and, and pretty uh, robust in terms of going backwards through the 1800s and into the 1700s. Uh, but recently we've noticed an uptick in the last few months of people doing research on general history uh, or historical topics. So, for example, we've had a number of research questions about transportation in the area, and our map collection has really come in handy for that, as well as people doing uh, research into local businesses, and our photograph collection has been pretty uh, useful in answering those questions. And again, the city directories have been really uh, important in, in tracing back businesses and tracing uh, the development of small business in the city. This is Mike Diana. He is our outreach and education manager. Um, we just thought it would be a, a, a good opportunity to show the collection in action. Um, he was in here doing some research for one of the upcoming programs that uh, he's working on. And this is an example of some of our photo collections. Um, this particular one was a, a education copy. We're in the basement storage area of the library. Uh, what I like to call the vaults. And this is uh, where we keep our uh, oldest items, our most fragile items, uh, the things that are part of our archive collection. Uh, so our manuscripts, the research files from local historians, uh, the historic manuscript collection, which includes things like deeds, wills, uh, and letters from the 1800s and 1700s. Um, this is also where we have our generally archived materials like our documents collection, which is behind me. Uh, the documents are sort of an ephemera collection that we have uh, compiled over the years. Um, we also include here in the basement two different kinds of shelving, which I think is kind of interesting because um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this kind of shelving, which is the sort of standard metal uh, do-it-yourself compiled together over years. Uh, but then over on this side is our movable shelving, which was donated to us by a doctor's office. So the style is a little bit different than what we would have purchased from a vendor who was you know, specifically working with library and archives um, storage, but it works pretty well. It's, it's the same kind of concept, it's just a slightly different size. So we have to be a little creative sometimes about how we stack boxes on these kinds of shelves. Um, 
On the metal shelves here, especially, we have things like ledgers from local businesses, um, doctor's offices, pharmacies, uh, and then our, a number of photographs from local photographers and um, local historians who phot photographed the area. So a few things to point out about our collection. As great as it is, as much information as we have, obviously there are weaknesses and things that we're trying to correct as we move forward in time. Um, one of the main things is how much of our collection has not been cataloged or has been under cataloged or under described. Um, this row, for example, here uh, is full of these delightful little rolled items and I have a list that just says rolled items. It doesn't actually explain what each of these items uh, could be. Um, so one of my big projects for the summer has been to go through and catalog and uh, um, try and figure out where everything is and what everything is and make sure it matches up with what should be in, in the collection. So as far as content goes, uh, one of the main problems that we have uh, is the representation of African Americans in our collection is pretty low and we're working on that to try and really document what's going on now but also moving backwards in time to try and fill that gap in our collection but that's true of a lot of um, the people in Schenectady and in the surrounding areas we're trying to um, meet the needs of a part of our community that we haven't paid attention to enough in the past. Um, another sort of weakness of the collection is especially in our map collection um, is the focus on Schenectady City and missing some of the surrounding areas so that's something that again we're working with local historians um, we're working with members of our community to try and fill in things like Princetown and Dwaynesburg uh, that don't have as much representation in our collection as Schenectady City or Glenville or Scotia so looking ahead for the future of the Grimm's Doolittle Library, in particular, I want to work on uh, doc continuing to document what's going on now um, and also filling in some of the gaps that we have for the 20th century as well, but also w look more into partnerships with people in the community to fill in those gaps, not just sort of waiting for us to have things donated to us by historians, but to really work with our community to to try and uh, collect deliberately um, and contemporaneously when we can. The other thing I'm really excited about is working more with uh, local schools and working with uh, the rest of the Historical Society staff on uh, various programs that we have um, you know, in, in over the calendar year, uh, including things uh, virtually like our uh, the Facebook live streams and our YouTube videos that have been kind of a new thing that we've started with COVID-19, but we're hoping to continue in the future. Um, and especially working with uh, local teachers to develop uh, lesson plans. We've been, worked with a few different people over the past year, and that's something that we hope to continue uh, to bring the materials, not just out of the stacks and into researchers' hands, but out of the library entirely and take them into schools when it's possible. I want to thank all of you for coming to the Historical Society with me today, and I hope that you'll be able to visit us in the future in person. Um, and in, in the meantime, please check out our online offerings on our website, on Facebook, on the Grubbs Through Little Library blog, and on YouTube. Thank you. So just as a, a wrap up to um, this video, I, I wanted to point out um, that the, the majority of the collection uh, came from local historians and that, that is what I was talking about, um, deliberate collection versus, let me stop share, deliberate collection versus uh, passive collection. So a lot of um, what we have in our collection uh, uh, came through several different filters before it got to us. Um, and so it's, you know, local historians um, who are d pursuing their own research questions um, and in some cases very niche research questions um, and we end up with their research files um, and their, collection, their book collections or their documents collections um, and in that way we are missing quite a bit of information because 
no, no one has researched it yet. And, and in some cases, you know, they're coming to us and wondering why we don't have it. And it's because they're the first one to ask that question. Um, so that is, is pretty important, I think, as, as we move forward and, and develop our collection more, it's to try and reach directly to record creators and or, um, organizations, small businesses, um, individuals, and, and get the documents from the source rather than waiting for someone to collect it because they're doing um, their own private research and then donating it to us many years in the future. So that sort of is the, the overview. Um, there's a couple other things that I could talk about as far as the historical society, um, you know, the types of programs that we do, some of the work that we've done over the past year with local teachers, um, and some of the other ways that we have managed our properties. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the Grams Do Little Library is an extension on a historic building. Um, the Brower House, we've been working on a few different things to sort of make that a more um, vibrant part of our um, operations. And of course, the Maybe Farm is, is the, there's a lot going on at the Maybe Farm. Um, so I can talk a little bit more about all of those if you'd like. So does anyone have any questions at this point? I saw something pop up in the chat. Oh, I have a question about your book collecting. Okay. Do you want to ask your question? There we go. I had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I I know that Albany Public Library Local History Room has been looking at doing what you were saying, going, reaching out and filling the gaps in their yearbook collection, but it sounds like you've been more successful than they have been. Um, so I don't know, I know you're fairly new, so I don't know if you were involved with that, but what, um, what steps were taken to get the yearbooks uh, into right. the society? Right, so yeah, that, that actually um, was initiated uh, I think two years before I started, so I don't have all of the, the ins and outs, especially from the very beginning, um, but it was basically just the, the overarching theme is just keep pushing the need and, and reaching out to, um, reach, reaching out through the membership of the Historical Society to get people to bring things in. Um, we, we advertise the need for these materials in uh, the local paper, the, the Daily Gazette, um, the local paper. We put it on our website, we put it on the blog, we put it out on Facebook, we put it out in um, whenever we had programs, we put out a call for, for these materials. So it was a lot of like just pushing and pushing and pushing and making sure it got mentioned every time we interacted with our community. Um, but the other thing that was, um, I think, really helpful was reaching out to people who have donated materials to us in the past and asking them specifically to look in, in their homes for these specific materials. Um, and I, I couldn't tell you which the the volume how how much of of the collection came from just general ask versus targeted specific to certain people um but there were there were people who you know were members of the historical society who had donated things in the past who had been teachers at some of the local high schools and so they had yearbooks going way back um things like that that seemed to to help quite a bit was to to sort of figure out and, and part of it is just sort of knowing your community uh, um, to a certain extent you know getting to know that's again when I talked about sort of the joy of working in the library here I really do get to know a lot of the researchers pretty well um, and get to know the people donating pretty well and we have a lot of repeat don donations um, things coming from the same family group um, so being able to sort of reach out specifically to those people in this case worked out really well for us um, in other ways it kind of is a hindrance because you know when I was talking a little bit earlier about the African American in the video I was talking about the African American representation in our collection is pretty low part of that is because so much of the historical society's history our membership has been almost all white so we don't have that same personal connection. I, I don't get, I don't have 
you know, when I go look through the donation lists, there's not a lot of names um, coming out of um, other parts of the collection. Like we, we have a small Jewish collection uh, amount of information about the Jewish community here in Schenectady as well. And again, you're looking at who were our members over the past hundred years that the historical society has uh, started in 1905. Um, so on the one hand for the yearbooks, it worked out really well because we had concrete relationships that we could tug on and get a fair amount of material specific to a specific gap um, through the people we've met and worked with with donations and research in the past but then on the other hand when I'm trying to address a, a much larger gap um, we don't have as many relationships in that part of the community and we need to work on that. So that it, it's a com it's a combination of things. It's not just any sort of one strategy that worked out really well, um, but I do think that having those relationships with the researchers was pretty key. Does anyone else have any other questions at the at this moment? Because I can talk a little bit more about some of the other things. Um, no? Okay, so I, I, in, in the, when we're talking in the map room, I mentioned some of the programs um, that, that we use that space for. Um, one of them that, that I find really exciting was a school program that we did um, with, uh, we've done it a couple of different variations on it with different schools, but one of the ones that I really liked was a, a document deep dive. Uh, where we had copies of documents from our collections. We set the students up on tables in the map room and had them do um, a really sort of deep analysis of what's in the document, how the document connects to other documents that other people were reading and, and do a discussion of that. Um, but then also trying to put those documents in a sense of place with the maps um, and make sort of connections to the physical, you know, where everything was taking place, the time periods that different things were taking place in, um, and connecting it to the physical representations of those um, spaces and time. So that was kind of a, an interesting combination of the map gallery and the maps that were up on, on the wall and the students working with documents from our collection. Um, and it worked out really well. We had a lot of really interesting conversation that came out of that. Um, another one that I thought is a good good use of the map room, um, uh, Mike, Diana, who you saw him reading in the video, he um, developed a, an orienteering program where students are tasked with like learning how to read maps and how to direct themselves through a space. Um, so it's a combination of spending time in the map room, working with the maps to try and, you know, trace routes. Um, and then also he gave them a map of the museum and had them actually walk around the museum and find things in the museum using the map to orient themselves into a space, which was kind of an interesting um, exercise. Uh, the question, are you working with public schools? I have heard from other institutions that it is getting difficult for students to leave their buildings and that their curricula are so tight now that they don't have time to do cool things like this. I guess I could have asked you to speak that rather than reading it. But yes, we are working with public schools. Um, and that is, that is a big deal. Um, having the students come to our location is getting harder and harder. Um, we're, we're working with public schools. We're basically, we work with any school that wants to work with us. Um, and so we've, we've gotten a good mix of public schools, private schools, and homeschool groups. We do have a fair number of, the, um, and, and I should rephrase that. Uh, most of our school group programs happen over at Maybe Farm. Um, and that's a little bit easier to do logistically, um, A, because they have a bigger parking lot <laughs> and the buses can drive into the farm parking lot a lot better than they can here at the uh, Historical Society in the Stockade. Um, but the other thing that is kind of really interesting about the Maybe Farm is that there's a lot more, um, there's a bit more financial support to have students go out to the farm than it is to do programs here at the Historical Society, um, both 
come both support from the school because it is kind of getting them into a space that they would never that that is um how should i phrase that getting them into a space that matches their curriculum more closely um, especially fourth graders fourth graders learning about um, new york history there's a lot of programs that we do over at the farm talking about new york agriculture that they really can't you can't experience agriculture any other way than to be at a farm um, so having uh, that sort of deep curriculum tie-in um, makes the money to, to support the farm more uh, school programs at the farm um, more readily available um, the other thing is we've applied to a lot of grants and, and worked with a lot of different granting agencies to get school school groups on our, our properties. Um, one of the big ones that unfortunately fell through due to COVID-19, uh, we had a grant um, from, I forget who the granting agency was, I think the NISCA group or, uh, there's, a, there's a, a better name for that and I'm, I'm sorry that I forget what the exact name of the granting agency was, but we got a grant to bus all Schenectady City fourth graders to the farm. And unfortunately, that didn't happen this spring. It was supposed to happen in April and um, May, and it, it didn't, obviously. Um, but we are hoping to get roll that grant over to a future um, school year, hopefully next, ne if all goes well, hopefully next year. Um, so, you know, that that is the big issue is where where the money come from and and a lot of it is us as an institution going out and working on grants and trying to find funding for busing especially busing um so that students can can come to our properties um the other thing though is that we have we have programs for kids throughout the year um and one of the ways that we kind of prove the, to our granting agencies how important um, our school programs are is the fact that our programs for kids are so well attended when they're voluntary um, and it kind of shows that the kids in this area really are getting a lot out of visiting our facilities and our properties and attending our programs um, and that sort of so they kind of feed each other you know like you're if you show that the kids are coming outside of school and then it kind of shows the value to having them come during school and having a curricula tie as well, um, their curriculum tie as well. And then the last sort of piece of this is um, working with teachers and really having strong relationships with teachers um, so that they're advocating on their side uh, for funding and for support from the school to to get the students off the property and in off the school out of the school and into onto our properties um, and having the the specific lesson plans that we work with with teachers to develop um, and having just strong relationships with them um, so that's that's one area again we're working on that a lot more than we have in the past that's something that is is really um, again, key to, to making sure that we have continued success with um, school programs. And one thing that Mike, Diana, and I have talked about now that, um, especially now that most people are struggling with coming back to school entirely, um, is to try and figure out virtual options for some of our programs um, and maybe scanning more documents and putting them up online and, and working with, with teachers to do um, lesson plans based off of digital materials and then videos of the farm or videos of the blacksmith shop that we have at the farm, things like that. So we we try we we try a whole bunch of things. That's the other nice thing about this the historical society is that there's a lot of opportunity to try a lot of different things and see what works, um, and just put it out there and and see what happens rather than having to be sure that something is going to be a success. 
that's one of the, the benefits I think of our approach is that we, we just try a whole bunch of things. We talk to a whole bunch of people. We see what's out there. We put out grants and, and applications and, and whatever we get, we, we, you know, any, anything could be at a success. We, we just keep trying different things and we'll see how, how it plays out. And I think our school programs are kind of one of those examples of something that we've tried a whole bunch of different things and we've finally found some, some things that are, are really successful um, and that we are able to sustain long-term. Um, and that I think is kind of important. Anything else? Other questions? <laughs> I guess we'll just wait a minute to see if anything else comes in. Um, but thank you for taking the time to move everything over virtually. I know uh, the original plan was to have it in person in July. Um, see, you know, the beautiful building in person. But uh, I think this worked really well. Um, so much information, and I'm excited to visit uh, being from Schenectady County. I have lots of ideas in my head now of things I want to learn about. Great. Um, That's excellent. Yeah. No, this, this has been excellent. Thank you so much. I know before we started the official recording, you had mentioned a few things um, that people can do in person there now um, during mm -hmm. the, during the pandemic so we just I don't know briefly go over those for the recording that would be great so people could take yeah. advantage absolutely so yeah so uh, for the pandemic we are we we reopened at the beginning of July um, and I mentioned about how we changed up our physical space um, here in the library uh, but we also switched from what we used to do where it was a walk-in only you no one ever had to make an appointment to come in to now it's appointment only so there are no more walk-ins um, so to make an, an appointment and that's true of all of our properties any any of our programs and any of our properties are now appointment only um, so the library is open for appointments um, research appointments the museum the front part of the the uh, building the the exhibit spaces and the galleries those are open uh, by appointment only. Um, we are open six days a week though, so Monday through Friday um, 9 to 5 and then Saturday 10 to 2. Um, and then we have guided tours over at Maybe Farm um, and those are again appointments. Um, people can book tickets online and then uh, come for a guided tour of the farm, which is kind of interesting in that um, we have always had guided tours at the farm and the or i should say in the last few years we have had guided years guided tours of the farm um, and we always tried to keep the group relatively small so that we could have a more intimate interaction um, but we're now a lot more conscious of how small we need to keep the groups um, and so far we've done pretty well as far as um, maintaining the small numbers um, in order to keep things safe and, and, and keep enable people to get a good experience even while they're keeping distance and wearing masks and, and all of that. The, the other thing is that um, we've had a pretty steady stream of people, especially here in the library, coming in to do research. So the, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised by the number of people who have come back since our reopening and have, um, we are now starting to do outdoor walking tours of the stockade area. Um, one of the other programs that we're able to start up again is our kayak tour on the Mohawk. Um, and again, that's something we were always very aware of the numbers of people, but the walking tour would be, you know, 20 to 30 people and now we're keeping it um, a lot smaller. Um, more like 15 people so that again we get we we can do it with social distancing um, and sort of maintain the quality of the experience um, of, the, of the walking tours. The other sort of big events that we have had um, you know we, we had planned to do some more events at the farm that we had to cancel um, we're hoping that in, as we move into the fall we have a couple of, of larger events that we're gonna 
tweak and be able to host um, in the fall. Um, one of the things here in the library is the genealogy day uh, celebration that we've had uh, many over for many years we we've had a a big event in October to celebrate genealogy day and archives month and I'm not sure what we're going to do about that this year I've started planning um, some of the things that I'm thinking about are, are virtual options um, maybe doing smaller more intimate workshops that are shorter rather than you know what we used to do where we'd have speakers come for an hour and we'd talk to a group of like 60 people and um that's not really necessarily an option so if we did maybe sort of smaller more intimate workshops that maybe last a half an hour or um instead of just having speakers in the morning and then in the afternoon do something different i'm, I'm not sure there's a couple of different things that i'm thinking about but that's one um event that in particular i have to come up with a plan now to 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 um adapt um but yeah it's it's an exciting time i think i mean it's obviously there's a lot going on and there's a lot to think about and it's in some ways a scary time but it's also an exciting time again because we can try something new and, and come up with some different options um for continuing the experiences that people have had here at the Historical Society, but in new ways. Um, so we'll see what happens with that moving forward. Um, there's uh, the other thing I want to point out about the Brower House, because um, I think people have had questions about that in the past, and we we don't really talk about it very much. Um, is that's a, that that is again the oldest house in the city that um, we've had you know a lot of research done to sort of um, prove its age and and support that claim um, but it's it's being used in a way it's never been used before it has been a residence for almost all of its history and now it is a creative space so it is a a studio space for art theater um, and crafts craftsmen um, craftsmanship activity. So we've got a, a soapsmith who uses our kitchen to create these really gorgeous uh, custom soaps. Um, we have um, a fine artist, we've got a theater troupe that comes in it that, and in particular, they really use the, the space in really creative ways, um, which is really interesting to see. Um, so you've got the backdrop of a colonial house, um, you know, with all the Dutch kitchen and the Dutch fireplaces and um, this really gorgeous old wood. And then you've got a modern theater company doing really interesting interpretations of um, art and theater. So I, I'm really kind of excited about that space. And then we're, we've recently revitalized the garden area. So now we can have um, another component, an outdoor component to, to some of the activities that we do in this, that space. And I just think, again, it's another example of us just sort of throwing it out there and seeing what happens. And it has worked out really well for us. Um, but it, I also think it's just a really neat juxtaposition um, which we do in other ways as well with the Historical Society, but it's a, a neat juxtaposition of how the historical aspect of our community meets the modern aspect, the current aspect, and we're combining, you know, our long history here in the area with the needs um, and expectations and the desires of our current uh, community, which is kind of a neat neat time neat, neat experience to be part of so. that's great um it looks like we don't have any additional questions so i think we're good at wrapping it up here um again thank you for hosting this tour um it'll be a great resource i think moving forward too and um i think a lot of people will find it helpful like I said, I'm uh, very excited to see what I can find now. Uh, so again, thank you for doing this with us. And thank you for organizing it. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. Very good. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, too.